Um, so, we're going to talk about Moodle 68 today. Um, what, we're, what are we going to talk about? What is Moodle signatures? I'm just briefly going to kind of fly through it uh, for those of you guys who haven't seen it that much yet. And what kind of magic can we do with it um, when you have multiple people having each one of them something? What's up? Hello. <laughs> each one of them having uh, their own key. There's a lot of things you can do it do to like uh, kind of put those keys together and, and make transactions. Are we good? Am I in the picture? Okay. We're gonna demo something. Uh, you've probably some of you seen it before. We'll see how it goes. And we're gonna fire up a couple of apps from uh, wallets to do a multi six transaction together. Who here has uh, an Electrum installed on their computer right now? One. I know there's another one. Three. Okay, that should be good enough. So we're gonna play around with that. I know there's at least some people in the room who know how it works, <laughs> so we should be able to get it going. All right. Let's start simple. So this is a um, this is a Bitcoin. I kind of wanted to. Whatever. Okay. Um, so this is a Bitcoin. Oops. This is a Bitcoin wallet. Here, it's a simple one. It's one address. It has one public key, which is basically a Bitcoin address. You simplify it and a private key, and you use, use the private key to sign the <coughs> transaction. Uh, that's all there is to it. <laughs> you make it simple for a one Bitcoin address. Now, what we want to do here today, the problem with one address is somebody steals your private key, all your funds are gone, um, which is not too good. But that's how most of us use it today. Let's see what we have. We have exactly the same thing here, except there's three of them. So we have now three different Bitcoin addresses. Before I continue, I would like, uh, I would like to say I'm going to present a lot of information here, and some of it might not be correct. So, so you guys tell me. If I run into like, uh, uh, thin ice, just let me know, and we're going to correct it. OK, so these are three uh, Bitcoin addresses. Each one of them has a public key, a private key, public, private, public, private. Key. The reason I did the public key green is because it's OK to share it. You're not going to lose your Bitcoin if you share your public key. If you share your private key, you're, gonna, you're likely to lose your Bitcoin if you share it with someone who, uh, who you don't trust. OK, so now we have three different addresses. We don't have a multi-signature address yet. And we don't even know what it is yet. So what we're going to do in the next step is take the public keys of those three different addresses. And those three different addresses might be different, different people's addresses. It might be one person. It might be two people. It might be three people. Any way you want it. It might be 20 if you really want to go that far. And you're creating one address. You can send money to that address. Uh, it starts with a, how does it start? A multi address. With three. It starts with the number three. Normal address starts with one. Multi addresses starts with free. Um, when we want to spend the money from multi addresses, it depends how we set it up. We said it's two or free. That means we will need two private keys in order to sign one transaction going out of this address. Okay. And this is how it would look. We take the private keys. We don't tell them to anyone. Uh, because the dangerous, we just sign the transaction and we kind of communicate the transaction along and sign it, both of those signatures, and that's how, uh, that's how we go ahead and, uh, and spend the money. All right, uh, so the thing is, like, I wanted to ask uh, how, how many of you actually use multi six uh, addresses to store your Bitcoin? Right? One, two, three. Okay, three people out of 25 or 30 in uh, San Francisco Bitcoin developers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice, you notice I didn't raise my hand, right? <laughs> so, so, so that's the situation today. Uh, the, I think one of the reasons today is uh, it's just complicated. Like, me as a user, what do I do? Okay, I know I could have and should have multiple signatures and, and stuff like that. Well, how do I go about using it? Do I print one on paper and now I have to store it? Do I give up my, one to my mom and why should I even care and what is it, whatever. So it's not many, the way it is today, not many people actually will use it, I think, until it gets a little simpler for the user or until you force the user to use it. And, uh, and there are ways of doing that for, for a service you have. Okay, did I go back or forward? Okay. 
So, so this, is, this is what we ended, ended up with. We have three different addresses. We put them together, the public keys, to create a multi-sig address. Now, uh, on our service, what we do, BitOasis, we want to be a Bitcoin broker in, uh, in Dubai. We want to we wanna be a Bitcoin wallet and merchant processing tools, which means we're going to have a lot of Bitcoins on our <coughs> Uh, on, our, on our customers, a lot, we're going to be holding a lot of customers' funds in Bitcoin. We've seen what happened before uh, with, uh, with Mount Gox and a couple other services. And uh, we, we kind of were going a long time back and forth, how do we want to do it? Originally, we were like, just like, you know what, let's just set up people with blockchain.info address and let them take care of it. We don't want to hold people's coins. And uh, then, we, th then I saw actually Ryan's presentation on, uh, on Coin Summit. And it, it's kind of stayed in my mind that there's a, there might be another way how to do it with signatures. And the way will be, we have, again, we have three different keys. I'm going to get into seats a little bit later. So we have three different keys. Those three different keys are held at separate places. And one of those keys we hold at our servers, at BitOS servers. Now, where do we put the other key? Where do we put the third key? And we're always going to use two keys to spend a transaction. And in, in a bit, I'm going to say, say why. So we, we were looking for someone to do that. We found CryptoCorp, which uh, so far uh, I would say is the only one that actually has some sort of working solution uh, that does something similar. Is there anyone else? It's possible that you might be able to rig up the Trusted Coin API to do it, uh -huh. but they won't do um, HD wallets. Okay. So you can only do one address at a time with their yeah. API. Yeah. Gets a more complicated. Yeah, also mm -hmm. um, I don't think they have an integration team. So yeah. we actually ship code to our partners. I don't think they do. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, that's that's this is what we went with so far because uh, it was the only way, <laughs> only one I was able to play around with and actually see it working, at least as a developer. So what we have now is three different places where we store one third of the key. One of them at our servers. The other one would be CryptoCorp, which the whole point of them having one key is when we want to make transactions. A transaction we always need two keys. Or the customer, we all, when we want to do a transaction for our customer, always need two keys. And their job is make sure that those transactions that are happening, uh, that are being created, are actually done by the user, uh, not by some malicious guy trying to steal his Bitcoin. So depending on the size of the transaction, maybe they send him an email, maybe they call him up, uh, whatever other options of how do you find out if that person is actually the person who should be doing the transaction. So normal flow would be, we create a transaction, uh, we want to sign it, we let CryptoCorp know through their API that we're about to do a transaction. Uh, they're gonna, if they need to, they're going to call this person up and be like, hey, uh, it says that you want to do this transaction, do you want to do it? Yes. It just says yes, they sign it, we sign it, and we propagate it to the Bitcoin network, the transaction goes out. Uh, the good thing is, if somebody hacks into our website, they only have one third of the key. Right? If somebody hacks into their website, it could happen, they only have one third of the key. Now the question is, where do we put the third key? When I saw Ryan's presentation, he was showing that we can print the key. That the user, as he's creating the wallet, he can print the third key. Now he has the third key, he puts it in a safe. If one of those two things, companies, are not communicating, don't exist anymore, when get bankrupt, are being sued for whatever, can't do anything, um, then the user could take his paper and with the remaining party do the transaction, get his funds out, maybe move them somewhere else. Now, when I was talking with this, uh, about this with my co-founder, I was explaining how it might work and he says, well, I don't really want people to print some stuff. When they register on our website, they, they go through the process, you ask them email, you ask them phone number, and now they're like, well, now we have to print this. And you're just like, I don't want to print this, I just want to see what's up in the website, right? And you're like, no, 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 until you can't receive any Bitcoin or send any Bitcoin until you print this. And he's like, well, I don't have a printer, right? So it gets complicated. And, uh, and uh, when, when we went on a call with Ryan, my co-founder uh, asked him, hey, like, we kind of like this whole multi-signature thing. Is there any way how to keep it secure and uh, not have the user print the, wall, uh, the, the key? And I was like, it's a stupid question. I can just print a key. And, uh, and Ryan said, well, why don't you, why don't you put the third key or the seed of those keys with a law firm. Why don't you store those keys with some law firm that will hold them 
and in, only in case one of those companies goes away, the law firm can cooperate with the remaining company to restore peace. I'm like, damn, that's, that's not bad at all. So that's what we're doing so far. And uh, that's what I'm gonna demo today, and uh, then we're gonna do some uh, transactions with Electric. You guys have any questions so far? We're going pretty fast. So just a quick note, um, if the law firm has, um, has a bunch of extended bubble keys that they're using one per user, and you can just work your way down that list, then you can actually replace that on a per user basis. So you start with um, normal users just don't have to see keys, but any user that would rather integrate in their own wallet and be able to sign transactions themselves can swap themselves out without changing anything for the other users. So it can be modular enough to still integrate into the user's copy of Electrum or Armory or Blockchain or whatever. The, the nice thing about using uh, a deterministic wallet, having a seed that you, uh, that you can derive more keys off, uh, we, we probably had a talk about it before. I'm not going to go too much into it because I don't understand it. Um, so uh, the, the, the nice thing about it is you just let the uh, lawyer create that seed, create the first public key, and then he just saves it. And uh, until some users need something like that, you don't need to talk to the lawyer anymore. Unless there's this schedule of situations where you can recreate all the stuff you need from the seed that the user just has somewhere in this safe. But don't you have to depend on the lawyer to secure the keys properly? It sounds like more common part is to make that list. <clears throat> well, if, if, so if the lawyer is compromised, he only has one key. <clears throat> so if, the way I'm looking at it, uh, what, we, what we tried to do is originally we wanted to have a paper as a third one. Now the disadvantage of the other paper is uh, the, the user can lose it. Now, if they, and most of them will, most of the customers will lose the paper. Sure, sure. Now, now if they do and one of the companies goes away, the whole point of having the paper uh, disappears. So the law firms are not free. But, oh, it's not. Law firms don't store stuff for free. But, but they are very, very experienced in keeping a single piece of paper very private. Very secret and very safe. But what was a free transaction is now a paid transaction because you have a law firm that will demand money for the service. Not per transaction. You, there's a the thing. You only need the lawyer once when you're setting it up. Right, but what was a free, print for free, paper now is a lawyer relationship business Well, agreement. we pay for that. Oh, you do? <laughs> but that's only one. You pay, you pay for one hour of the lawyer's time. How much is that? I don't know. A lot of money. How much? What's the range? It depends on the one you're $900 per hour. Well, so on $300, what was a paper wallet is not a $300 transaction. <laughs> you're getting some advantages with it, though. Okay. It's true, though. It's true. It's true. One, one paper wallet for all of their customers. That's okay, but you're paying the fee. Now, now if you... Now if you <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that's only one time. It's only okay. one time. Not a customer. No, no, no. no. One, one time at all. One time, time for business. One time for an HD wallet. Oh. That's oh. the whole point. Oh, very cool. <laughs> okay. So, so he only he only creates the, the lawyer only creates a C, and he creates a public key in the minimum situation. He gives us the public key. We create some sort of he would know no more, Ryan would know more. You create some sort of master address, and from this address, we derive all the addresses from, for the customers. Got it. So we don't need to talk to the lawyer anymore. Got it. It's, if it's a thousand bucks, and it's one time when you set up the company. That is possible. And uh, <laughs> the crypto <the, the laughs> you cannot amortize that cost against thousands of customers. Right, right. And uh, do the lawyers have to understand this? No, I hope so. So, so uh, what, I, uh, what I thought That's we would do yeah. was just make a little app for them that they just run, and it tells them, print this, and store it, don't show it to anyone. Then they click on a button and it says, send this to me and, and, and Ryan. It'll be the public key. And that's it. And they print what they needed to print. And until one of the companies goes bust, or, uh, then uh, we don't need to talk to them. We actually Nobody's. already have that app. What is it? We already have that app. I hope you do. We, we, have, we haven't published it yet. But okay. We'll, we'll publish it as open source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you did. I, I hope, I hope you did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so that's that. Uh, the lawyer, the lawyer shouldn't doesn't have to have any technical background to do that. He just prints a paper and they tells need it. to know how to keep a um, like document two sentence long string secret, safe and recoverable. Hmm. But this is one of the things that they do. Okay, they're very good at that. Okay. So as far as I know, Bitgo, from what I was talking with them. They said they have something uh, in works. They said they're going to have the solution easier to use for developers than, than CryptoCorp. 
what they said was that we wouldn't need on our, on the on the developer side running a, a business like BitOasis. You wouldn't need a hierarchical uh, wallet, but you would just need a simple one. And they would kind of figure out the hierarchy on their own side. I know how exactly. Hmm. I know what exactly that means. But that's what they told me, and they said it will be ready in a couple of weeks for testing. I don't know what that means either, but it sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, probably if they told you, it would probably sound better. Because I'm all, always saying what, how I... I, well, then, I don't know, but I, I haven't talked to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's... There's, so there's a, there's a, there's we're, this we're, we're pretty proud that we use the normal Bit32 hierarchies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that makes it really easy to develop and you don't have to figure out something new. So, so, so the whole problem when, when I was starting to work with this and, and the stuff I was most struggling with in the beginning is I couldn't find anything, any actually working uh, mod out there that can do hierarchic uh, uh, deterministic stuff as well as multi-signature. And uh, uh, I've got, for Ryan, I've got implementation of uh, uh, some sort of modified electrum that could do it. Uh, but there's not much stuff out there yet. Uh, and I guess it's coming out. I've talked to uh, Armory, mm -hmm. and Armory are working on a, on a multi-sig functionality <coughs> in, their, in their world as well. Uh, I don't know how well it will actually connect to the world being deterministic. I don't know if it all is connect, ends up being connected together or not in Armory. But I've talked to them, they said they're working on it. And uh, let, me, uh, let me add something to that. Uh, at BitPay, we've developed a multi-signature wallet that does Bit32, all this stuff. It was and the Copay, said, right? Copay. Yeah, yeah. I tried to install it, and I ended up installing it, but I didn't get too comfortable with it in order to be showing it here. But there, there, there was, right, just recently there, there, was this, uh, there was this one going out. And what was the problem you felt that it didn't make you feel comfortable? I wasn't able to install it at first. Then I was, and, and once I well, once I finished uh, installing it, I wanted to run it and playing around with it. You need to kind of open your browser first to kind of see what's up. It wouldn't even let me. Probably some sort of port restriction stuff on my laptop. And I was like, oh, this is getting complicated. It's one part of it. Second part, me personally, I'm not comfortable with JavaScript because I don't know how to code in it. So uh, that, this, this is the other part of it. So uh, I, I bet it's a good solution, but I can't use JavaScript in a way that I feel comfortable using it. We're, we're fans because it does actual HDM. It sounds a lot less scary than what that goes to. Oh, with no green address? Hmm? Have you seen green address? Green I've, I've talked to them also. Uh, green address, the IT. Um, they, they provide some sort of, let's try to sign up. Maybe I even probably sign up before. Green address. What's up? Last okay. It's probably, oops, whatever. <laughs> I don't have any money. No, that it was the seed though, it wasn't the, yeah. So you can either use the seed or you can use oh, you can actually four digit seed. pen. Okay. Now you saw my seed, there's nothing in there. Uh, green, <laughs> green address is, uh, uh, I've asked them if they have any APIs. For, for, for us to use, and they do. I don't know if they're able to create some sort of uh, business solution like us when we're trying to hold other people's money uh, using their uh, website as first thing. Second, I, I guess that's it. Yeah, I don't really know if they provide some sort of similar service as, as uh, CryptoCorp does. Maybe they do. Maybe you guys can get someone from Green Address here to talk about it. He lives in London. His name is Larry. Yeah, we would need to find him. <laughs> so what I like about what they do is um, they actually don't, they run a wallet service, they don't actually store anything server side except for a link between the pin and the password. That's it. They don't, they don't even store the encrypted back of the seed like blockchain does. So they give you the seed and you can use that to create wallets. Well, what, what I found kind of scary was when I was trying to log in and I was typing in my seed, it actually showed it. Uh, which I guess... Well, you don't have to. If you type in just your pin on the other side... Just the pin? Uh -huh. Okay. And if I, if I use the pin, how do they, how do they work with it? They so they've encrypted your seed locally using that pin. in your cache. Yeah. In my Us cache? Using a, pa a long password that they determine server side. Okay. And the pin is just an alias on their server between the pin and that long password. So, uh, so if you say in cache, so if I remove my browser, 
If you remove your browser, then you'll have to use the seed again. Then I have to use the seed. Okay. Please match the requested format. Okay. For now. Green address is a. Uh, I've looked into that, and what they say actually. How much time do we have? Uh, you have about. Uh, I think we, you know, five to ten minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one interesting thing they do that, uh, that's different than what Bitco does and it's different than what we do. So what we do and what Bitco does is they, we try to have three keys, two of which under user control or one of which under user control or something like that. Green address just does two keys, the one on the green address server and the one in the wallet. And then every time they get a payment, the way they protect you against them going away is they send you an end lock time transaction. Yes. Pre-signed. And so they're saying this transaction, you can countersign it, and it'll be a valid transaction, but it won't be valid for about 90 days. About how long? 90 days. And so if, uh, if they go away as a company, all the funds get recovered up to 90 days later. That's too scary, because then could you, could you they all all my security is back to like the security of my email. Because if, yeah. if, let's say, for example, my private keys on my email, then someone gets access to my email. With my key, they sign it for 90 days and they can propagate. This, this is why we're really big fans of three different keys yeah. with three different security situations. So Could you know, maybe a key in the hot wallet, yeah. a key that you backed up however you do, and a key on your server. So, so as far as, as uh, green address go, goes, uh, could you repeat the rule with the 90 days? How exactly yeah. does it So out? they do two out of two wallets. Two out of two, okay. Um, okay. Rule is two out of two. And they do one on their server, one on their, one on their hot server. wallet, okay. and then they do one that's in the local wallet that's, that's created from the seed. In my cache, in my browser. Or that's something. right. Okay. And every time you receive a payment or you send a payment, you receive change. Okay. They create a new spend transaction okay. that takes that from two of two and puts it in one of one. Okay. But they end lock time at 90 days in the future. Okay. And so all you need to do to make that new legit transaction is countersign it and wait. Mm -hmm. And then once you've waited long enough, you'll be able to broadcast it. Interesting. And what they have a cool tool that they mm -hmm. call Gentle. If you Google for green address Gentle, that's the tool they use for doing the countersign. And that's at Lohosa and GitHub pages. Is it gentle? Uh-huh, it's like that. Very cool. <coughs> okay, that's what they use for to do that. Yeah, there's there's a there's a version of that hosted on GitHub pages that's just mm -hmm. in my app. You can use to sign transactions. I have a question for the two of you. Uh, how easy would it be to adapt this so that uh, it would be three people? Let's say in a corporate organization, who would sign it? That's what Copay is for. Having the other other. Yeah, actually, Copay was yeah. There was a very good example. There's a video uh, I've seen of one of the pre previous presentations where you actually open the Copay page mm -hmm. and you see the faces of the other people talking with you over 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 a camera to get together and sign the transaction. So mm -hmm. I found I found it actually really nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Copay did a really elegant UX around that. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And then uh, what, we, what we do instead is we'll build the authorization flow into our decision of whether or not to sign. Mm -hmm. So instead of asking the, uh, the authorizers to get on a wallet and sign an actual transaction, yes. we'll call them on the phone and okay. make them respond. Like, yeah, like we did a couple of minutes ago. There we go. Yeah, can you talk about um, the differences between you know, the multi-sig and the fragmented backups and uh, some of uh, you know, I'm, doing that. I'm, I'm realizing now that Armory, does, that Armory doesn't do multi-sig, it actually has a, a single key that's split into two or three so, so, So I've never worked with fragmented backups. Uh, so the, he would know more. There's an algorithm guess. called Shamir's secret chain mm -hmm. that they use to break a backup into multiple secrets and you need a quorum of those secrets to reconstruct it. Mm -hmm. um, it's similar to multi-sig in that you have the M of N mechanic. What's different is when you reconstruct it, you end up with the actual secret on the computer that you reconstructed it on. And yeah, in the same yeah, place. So, so, so multi-sig you can use to keep the secrets separated right. and have integration between them. Whereas secret sharing, they're only separate while they're not reconstructed. If you want to reconstruct them, you have to bring them together. Um, people are working on something called threshold transactions. 
which is even better than multi-sig because it's a little bit more flexible and still doesn't require having secret sensing places. I'm not totally up on how much of transactions yet because I'm a very ambiguous age. Are those like stage accounts? No, that, that's just different rules around the multi-sig. So you guys had enough multi-sig in the real world for one day? Hmm. Looks yeah. like. Looks like. Looks good. You guys look really filled up with multi-sig. <laughs> I want to say thank you very much, Tom. I think that's the first time.